pleasure to be here and I appreciate the invitation. Um, this is a, a complicated uh, issue for the WTO. I think um, you know, we would rather that uh, these kinds of conversations be occurring in Geneva. And we always appreciate the, the statements that uh, all the leaders generally make about uh, the WTO, the multilateral system is generally uh, where they'd rather be. Uh, but it, it's complicated in terms of uh, getting all members to agree at the WTO, and that's one of our principles, is all members agreeing on taking a conversation forward. And for many of the issues that are being discussed in TTIP, in particular TPP um, and other deep regional agreements, there isn't necessarily agreement among members at the WTO to engage on those issues. So in some sense, I, I think what Christian was saying, uh, that uh, there are countries that are willing to uh, go to what we call WTO and beyond, or WTO plus, and uh, perhaps uh, try to work through some of those issues and come up with potential models for, the, for uh, other uh, WTO members to consider down the line. I think that that is a, a positive uh, potential outcome. Uh, but at this point, other WTO members aren't engaged in the discussion around those rules. They're not engaged in uh, shaping them. Uh, one of the questions that Andreas asked me was, you know, what, does, what do you think this means for the WTO's role with regard to shifts in global trade governance? So let me just give you a little uh, view, I think, uh, from the Secretariat's view at the WTO. I think it's important to remember that the WTO has a negotiating aspect. And recently, uh, at, the, at Bali, there was an agreement on trade facilitation. And that looks like it's moving forward. And by our assessment, that's a very big agreement that could, uh, in terms of contribution to global economic growth and trade, uh, uh, certainly rival the Uruguay round. Uh, it may seem like a small agreement, but it's actually very substantial and its multilateral benefits all countries. We also have the ITA2 recently, um, which uh, looks like it's going to uh, potentially have significant effects. There's uh, uh, engagement around environmental goods. So there are negotiations ongoing, even if Doha doesn't seem to be able to progress, and those negotiations make a big difference. So that's the negotiating arm. Then there's dispute settlement. Uh, since the WTO was created, there's been over 500 dispute settlement cases that have been resolved, largely with members accepting and uh, reasonably uh, satisfied with the fairness and equity of the process. So now we have economic disputes, international economics disputes, being settled uh, at the WTO in a way that members uh, are satisfied generally with the outcomes. Um, we also have um, a surveillance and transparency aspect that's often overlooked where we provide uh, trade policy reviews, discussions of member countries' trade policy settings um, and, and developments so that other countries can uh, be aware of what's happening. We must also not forget that uh, WTO membership continues to increase. So in, um, let's see, in 1947 there were 23 members. As of right now there are 161 members. 20% of which have joined since 1995, the creation of the WTO. So in many ways, we do feel like even though the high profile uh, negotiations aren't necessarily being successful, um, that the WTO is functioning. Another, and, and, and I want to emphasize this point, almost every RTA that's negotiated has essentially deep WTO DNA embedded in it. So I just referred to WTO plus and WTO beyond. That's because some issues in these mega regionals do go beyond what the WTO is, but everybody's concerned about what they might mean for the WTO. And in some cases, particularly for WTO plus, it's building on already agreed upon WTO language. Um, and then all the market access um, agreements uh, fit within the WTO. So I think, um, you know, we would prefer to see these uh, discussions, these evolutions, this advancement happening in Geneva, but we also feel that uh, the WTO is functioning. It, it is 
uh, uh, an effective, playing an effective role in, in global trade governance. Um, now, some of the other issues that were brought up, and, and this has been a fascinating discussion, if I, I get the opportunity, in a sense, to try to quickly react to some of what I've heard. Um, Uli talked about, you know, these are big countries, right? And he divided it into trade diversion, trade creation, and regulatory spillovers. I'm a professional economist. I've done a lot of this economic analysis. I've done the, the kinds of work that Gabriel and uh, Uli are talking about. It's really important in those economic models, you are isolating the effect, of trying to isolate the effect of the agreements under negotiation, under discussion. There are many other things going on. So you cannot, you can analyze TTIP in isolation. You can analyze a trade agreement in isolation. But are you going to reverse globalization? Are you going to tell uh, the Soviet Union, China, and India, forget about what you did in the 1980s and 1990s and join uh, the, the, the global marketplace to bring your workforce into engaging with the world economy? Um, are you going to stop technological progress? Many of the concerns of, of, that I've heard expressed here about particularly growing inequality um, most economic research suggests that that's really got to do with more technologically biased, te te biased technological change, okay, as opposed to specific trade agreements. Many of these factors you have to deal with. You can't stop. You have changing comparative advantage that has effects just like trade diversion and trade creation. Um, economic growth, GDP growth, quantitative easing, macro policy, tax policy, fiscal policy, I can assure you, almost any single one of those elements, GDP growth, macro policy, quantitative easing, will swamp, will swamp any of the economic effects that we do modeling these, these ne trade negotiating agreements. They're only a part of GDP, tariffs tend, tend to be small, uh, technological transfer, those, all of those things are gonna have much bigger effects, and those are things that you need to look at these agreements in the context of. And you're not going to stop those other factors. If you do, you will likely impose significant costs upon your economy. So um, it's really important when you think about these other factors to have coherence in trade policy and domestic policy. And I think one of my frustrations as a practicing economist is to see everything associated with a trade policy when much of the discussion really needs to talk about evolution and developments in domestic policy in a way that's coherent with mega trends in the global economy as well as trade policy negotiations. Um, between <coughs> 2000 and 2011, this period of globalization, okay, a, a, a hyper period of globalization, developed countries' contribution to GDP, global GDP and global trade grew significantly. That's not just China, that's not just the dynamic emerging economies, that was also least developed countries. Um, understanding global value chains, I've done some personal work in this area, particularly on the US and Mexico, uh, but also the US and China and globally. It does affect your economic modeling. And for many years, people just looked at trade data and assumed that trade data was measured the same way that um, GDP data is. Not at all, trade data, is gross sales data doesn't necessarily reflect the value added that the different countries are, are producing. Mm -hmm. So um, firms, let, let, me, let me try to close with uh, a, a comment that I think uh, the ambassador kind of generated in my head. Why is there so much consternation around trade policy? You mentioned that firms have to adjust. Okay, consumers have to adjust, workers have to adjust. Um, we know the past or at least we think we know the past and the drivers of the past. Um, we know the existing firms. You know if you've got a job now or if your neighbor has a, jo has a job. Um, you know the products. You know the quality of the products. What you don't know is the future. You don't know how firms will change. You don't know what the new firms will be. You can observe the firms that did not succeed. You can observe some of the firms that succeed. Um, and then there are many new firms that come in and enter the new jobs, the new products. This uncertainty, I think, causes a lot of debate. And that debate is probably a good thing. And 
getting better engagement in um, society with elected officials and trying to figure out how to do that efficiently and effectively is probably something that uh, we're continuing to learn about. Um, I would assert that at the WTO we have existing processes that certainly allow countries to engage in that discussion and debate. Um, it's open, any member has an opportunity to speak, and we've been working hard on ensuring that civil society and, um, and firms have a way to, uh, to engage in our conversations. But um, it's really not, um, not something that I think is simplified as it's all good or it's all bad. It's about negotiating um, something that moves people firms and countries forward and doing that in a way that uh, society can be comfortable with. And, um, but change creates discomfort. Attributing it all to trade agreements, I think, is, or attributing too much to trade agreements compared to other economic factors, I think is, is something that uh, uh, hurts the, the actual quality of the discussion. So, um, you know, we welcome any of these discussions at the WTO. We think we provide a good forum for those kinds of conversations and exchanges. Uh, we think that uh, actually most RTAs seem to be advancing the, the goal of liberalization, but we also think that there are benefits to bringing it to Geneva.